Hey, welcome back to the Benedict Challenge. Today I'm going to talk a little bit more about autophagy, the stress response to starvation or to a period of going without food. And specifically, this is triggered when the body has to go without carbs or protein. You can trigger it by either extended ketogenic dieting or a periodic protein fast or just plain old fasting. But either way, you're triggering the body to be more resourceful. And it's a vital adaptation for human beings, which probably enabled us to outsmart our competition and become sharper and even more cunning during lean times instead of just falling apart at the first sign of scarcity. So autophagy can be stimulated by ketogenic diets as well as intermittent fasting, but there's really nothing like a long-term fast of two or three days to really maximize autophagy. The good news is that you don't need to be doing long fasts every week or even every month. In fact, it's recommended that you only do extended fasting two or three times per year. I want to talk about some of the other benefits of autophagy, such as anti-aging and cancer prevention. This past weekend, a woman in my parish shared with the community that she had been diagnosed with a benign but sizable tumor, which would have to be removed surgically through an invasive procedure. She prayed and fasted in the days leading up to the procedure, and afterwards, the doctor reported with surprise that he had only removed a small growth compared to what had been originally detected with imaging equipment. What had been the size of a fist had been reduced to just a pebble size. Was this a miraculous healing or simply the body doing this self-eating, this autophagy, enough so to cleanse her tissues of the tumor? Who knows, but I certainly don't want to rob God of any of the glory for this. It's a reminder that we are embodied creatures and that our spiritual life includes care of the body and the soul. When we get rid of the obstacles to God's healing, such as constantly eating or worrying, we create the conditions for miracles to take place. That takes willpower, and it also takes faith. There have been many studies, however, that confirm this effect from a scientific perspective. A 2016 JAMA Oncology study on women with breast cancer found that those who fasted for more than 13 hours a day had lower rates of cancer recurrence. It's unclear whether this comes from autophagy or lowering blood glucose levels, since cancer cells use glucose as their primary energy supply. You find these same benefits from caloric restriction, where basically cancer and various malignant kinds of growth are deprived of their fuel source. With fasting, the difference is that you don't have to restrict calories on the whole. You get none of the negative side effects of caloric restrictions, like less energy, lower libido, and feeling all around less awesome, and most, if not all, of the benefits of anti-aging, protection from cancer, and autophagy from fasting is also protective against neurological diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and other forms of dementia. Autophagy maintains the quality of our stem cells, these backup cells that we have that help renew all of our tissues from our muscles to our bones, and which are held in abundant reservoir when we're young, only to get depleted as we age. Most of us want to live a long time, but no one wants to get older if that means forgetting where you are, being unable to enjoy life, and just generally not aging gracefully. If you want to live not only a long, but a vibrant, active life, and if you want to live life to the fullest, as Jesus promises to those who follow him, following the commandment to fast is essential. Sure, you can get some of these benefits from exercise, better sleep, or just restricting protein and carbohydrates. But for simplicity, nothing beats fasting as a regenerative, rejuvenative discipline.
All right, today is the third and final video on autophagy, and I'm going to ask you to hold two ideas in your head at the same time. The first one is that protein is an essential, vital nutrient, and if you're not getting enough protein during your one meal a day or two meals a day, you're going to stay hungry. Your body will not be getting the building blocks that it needs, so it's going to continue to signal through hunger and other signs of weakness that you need to get enough. Now, the second idea is that we can overdo it when it comes to protein, not so much when it comes to the quantity in any given meal, since protein is so filling and satiating, it tends to be auto-regulating in that sense. However, we can have too much protein in the sense of eating all the time. If every day we're eating the same amount of protein, we're never giving our body a chance to get into that catabolic or breaking down mode of which autophagy is a part. So let's just kind of review what this autophagy is. It's happening at a low level all the time, rises for the first two to three days of a fast, and then peaks at around five times the normal rate of recycling this old accumulated junk before then coming back down as the body rests into fat burning mode. It's going to start to spare your lean muscle tissue at that point. It's difficult to be in this intermediate space where autophagy is going on because your body is going without the resources that it normally has to build itself back up. We're programmed to relate food with the energy and vital building blocks that we need, and so we experience a reward when we get it. And not having these things accessible, even though it makes our cells more resilient, it only does so after this period of relative weakness. And this is the paradox of hormesis, or beneficial stress. We need stress in certain quantities in order to thrive and survive, but if we have them in too great a quantity, then it can actually harm or kill us. This is true of autophagy, just as it's true of resistance training, of cold exposure, holding your breath. These are all things that on a certain range can make your cells more resilient, stronger, and better suited for whatever comes at them in this crazy world of ours. So the paradox of hormesis, you can kind of think of it like the paradox of the incarnation or any of these spiritual paradoxes where we have to hold two ideas in our, in our head at the same time. Now, what's the optimum level of autophagy? Sadly, we don't actually know in human beings how long it takes to get into autophagy. We have some guesses, but intermittent daily fasting might not be enough. We know that it can happen in as little as 24 hours for mice, but people aren't mice. Because of this thing called the power law or the Pareto rule, you often get most of your benefits from a small amount of extra effort. You might find that you get more than 50% better results from a 32-hour fast than you do from a 24-hour fast. Maybe you'll get double the results. But 32-hour fasts are hard. I know I don't often have the willpower to do them very often. Now enter the periodic protein fast, which I alluded to in the last video. The periodic protein fast is where you only eat carbohydrates and fat for a whole day. That means under 15 grams of protein. If you add in the eight hours of sleep on either side of a day, you fasted from protein for at least 32 hours, if not longer, if you can make it to lunch or dinner the next day. Now just to give a sense of what 15 grams of protein looks like, that's about two hard-boiled eggs, so it's really not very much, and ideally you might want to even try to keep it lower. So Josh Whiten has a little sample menu that he offers for people that are trying to do the periodic protein fast, and they don't always necessarily combine into the hearty meals that you're used to, but they can stave off hunger, keep you focused on the tasks at hand, and make it less of a, a, a chore and a challenge and something that you can do a little bit more often, maybe once a month or a couple times a year. So here are a few things that he recommends. First is tea or coffee, which you can enjoy throughout the day with plenty of cream. You could use coconut cream or milk for variety. Or if you're a coffee drinker, you can try bulletproof coffee where you add butter and MCT oil and then blend it up to get these kind of micro bubbles. Another delicious option is fruit and cream. You know, strawberries and cream, you can make it whipped heavy cream. Just make sure you're not adding too much sugar. 
Insulin is one of the factors that reduces certain kinds of autophagy, but just by restricting protein, you can still have major autophagy going on. Next up is a salad. You can still have salad greens with olives, even add some avocado, drizzle it with some olive oil, warm bacon grease, salt and pepper. You've got a hearty meal with no protein. You might want to try buttery sauerkraut. I've talked about how fermented foods are an important part of the nourishing one meal a day. So if you want something warm and filling, just melt a few tablespoons of grass-fed butter over some warm sauerkraut. I know it sounds weird, but trust me, it's really delicious, so don't knock it till you try it. And another one is cooked greens, whether kale, collards, chard, or spinach. Cook it in some bacon grease or coconut oil. Just don't eat the bacon. And then lastly, if you're uh, able to include more carbohydrates in your diet, you can try eating a baked potato, maybe some sour cream, drizzle it with your favorite oil, butter, salt, pepper. Mm. My mouth is watering just thinking about it. So that's the periodic protein fast in a nutshell. If you've been programmed by the idea that we need protein, rightly so, you might consider this as a periodic or a sporadic practice. Sporadic fasting can have many benefits beyond what you get from intermittent fasting because the randomness of it keeps your body on its toes, keeps it guessing, and forces it to adapt to these different situations. And as we've seen, our cells have built into them this ability to adapt and respond to stress, to become stronger than they otherwise would be in the absence of that stress. 